It's February 2nd, Groundhog Day, and we're doing our um, tube guitar amplifier webinar session for newbies. And we're going we're gonna to make this real basic. This is the first of a series of four. Um, the thing about uh, tubes and, and uh, electric guitar and all that sort of thing is um, it's got a you know, electric guitar has to have an amplifier. If you don't have an amplifier, it's not an electric guitar. The amplifier is what makes it an electric guitar. And in order to understand vacuum tubes and amps, we need to know a little bit about electricity. Now, electricity is um, it's kind of elusive because you can't really see it. You can't weigh it, but we know it's there. It has an effect, just like gravity. You can't see the gravity, but you know it's there because you know the effect of it. And um, the thing about electricity is it acts a lot like water. So we're going to use a lot of uh, water examples uh, when we talk about electrons flowing because, you know, electrons flowing, you could think of it as water flowing because water flows, electrons flow. Uh, water flows through a, a hose, electrons flow through a wire or a conductor, which is like a hose for electrons. So um, there's two different types of electricity and both are used in a guitar amp. And you've probably know, you probably know this already, uh, but there's AC, which stands for alternating current. Let's see if I can write this alternating current. And then there's DC, which stands for direct current. Now what's the difference? What is the difference? Well, here's the difference. Direct current flows in one direction AC current flows in both directions. And I can give you some examples of uh, AC current, DC current. For instance, a flashlight. You hook up a flashlight, the flashlight's got some batteries in it. Now this is the schematic symbol for a battery, okay? There's a battery. So let's say you got a flashlight and the, fl the battery is hooked to a bulb. This is gonna be my little light bulb. And of course, there'll be a little switch on your flashlight. And uh, there'll be a glass around this bulb here. But there's your flashlight right there. What happens is when you turn the switch on, electrons flow from negative to positive. It's that old physical um, principle that opposites attract. So negative is attracted to positive. So on your battery, if uh, actually I've got this drawn wrong, let's make that the negative. Okay, this is the negative side. Your electrons would then flow from the negative side. They want to get to the positive side, so they have to flow through this light bulb. And they flow around like this and back through the battery and they continue to go. But they're only going in one direction. They're going in this direction. And this is a good example of DC current. Now, a good example of AC current would be anything that pl plugs into your wall because your house is 120 volts AC. And what happens is if you plugged, um, let's say you got a wall outlet here. I'm going to draw a little wall outlet. And you plugged your lamp, a light bulb. I'm going to draw another light bulb. This time it's not a flashlight. It's just a regular light bulb and this is going to plug into the wall here well you've got 120 volts ac and it's called 60 hertz and what 60 hertz means is that it goes back and forth 60 times per second <laughs> so the first 60th of a second the current's flowing this way and then a 60th of a second later, 
it's flowing the other way. And then a 60th of a second later, it's going back this way. So this is called alternating current. It flows both directions, not at the same time. And a lot of times they will do a representation of alternating current. I know you've seen a, a representation of a sine wave where it'll, they'll do something that looks like this. And um, this dotted line representing no current or zero. And then this being plus and this being minus. So when it flows one direction, it's considered plus. And when it flows the other direction, it's considered minus. Um, how many people have seen a picture like this, something like this of a sine wave before? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Anybody seen that before? Quite a few people have seen that. Okay, that's good. I'm going to put everybody's hand down. Okay, so now we know the difference between AC and uh, DC uh, current. Now let's talk about um, the other principles of electricity. You know, I tell you that it acts a lot like water. Well, consider water. You know, with, with water, there's two things you've got is you've got your volume of water, which in water, we call that gallons. But in electricity, we call it amperage. And a lot of times they just call it amps for short because people don't usually say amperage. We're lazy. We say amps. But that's the volume of electrons that pass a certain point. Um, and then the other thing you have with water and also with electricity is pressure. And with, um, you know, with water, they, it would be pounds per, I don't know, what is it, pounds per square inch or something? I don't know. There's, there's some kind of um, measurement for pressure. But with electricity, it's called voltage. So let's look at the different scenarios of what you have with amps and voltage. Um, with, with amps and voltage, and I'm going to get a new screen here, and we'll start over with another drawing. Okay, so you've got, you've got amps, and you've got voltage. And the amps is the volume of electrons and the voltage is the pressure or of the electrons. Let's see electrons. Okay. Now here's the possibilities. You can have um, low amps or low amperage and low pressure or low voltage. And if you compared that to water, that would be like a tiny drip coming out of a faucet. Because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have any pressure to it. It'd be hardly any pressure, and it wouldn't have a lot of gallons. So it'd be like a drip coming out of a faucet. Low amps, low voltage. Okay, you could have low amp, high voltage, and this would be like a um, blowing water through a soda straw or even a high pressure wash at a car wash. You know, you're blowing high pressure water, um, through a soda straw because you don't have a lot of gallons there, but you have a lot of pressure. Okay. 
You could also have, what else could you have? You could have high amps, low voltage. And this would be like a slow moving river. A lot of gallons, not much pressure. And then the other scenario that you could have would be high current, high pressure, and this is going to be the Hoover Dam breaking, where you've got uh, a lot of pressure and a lot of gallons. So anyway, these are these are the different scenarios of what you could have with electricity in terms of current and voltage. And we're also going to talk about resistance and wattage here in a minute. Um, but I'm going to pause for a minute and see if anybody has any questions they would like to ask on anything we have up to this point. I see Andrew D'Angelo's got his hand up. Andrew, do you have a question? Or did you just have your hand up from a few minutes ago and forgot to turn? Okay, no question. Okay, very good. He just sent me a message. Okay, has anybody got any questions on anything we talked about so far? Okay, now what we're going to talk about next is we're going to talk about um, a circuit. Oh, let's see here. Okay, here. so here's your circuit. The word circuit. It comes from the same Latin root as circle. And that's what a circuit is. It's a circle. And I, I could draw a, a circuit very easily. Just we take a, um, we just have a, a battery. Let's let this be a little nine volt battery. <coughs> and of course, with a nine volt battery, that's going to be DC, right? Because it's all going to go one way. And this is the plus end of the battery, and this is the minus end of the battery. And let's say we just hook this up to a resistor. If you did that, then current would flow. And it would flow from negative through the resistor. It's trying to get to the positive. Because remember, opposites attract. So it's trying to go to the positive over here. And it would flow in this direction. Now, how much current would flow will depend on this resistor value here. The bigger the resistor, the less current will flow. Because think of a water hose again. We're talking about using all these water analogies. A resistor is like a kink in the hose. So if the if the kink, if you got a big kink in that hose and the water can't hardly get through, then it's going to be low current. As the kink becomes less of a kink, you have more current. And there are specific formulas to to figure this out um, called Ohm's law and they you can specifically figure out how much current and how much voltage if you know and how much resistance if you know two you can figure out the other the um, formula for this is current equals voltage or pressure voltage divided by resistance now if you pick up a electronics book they're going to represent this as e i mean as i they always use i for for abbreviation for current equals e is the abbreviation for voltage over r 
But basically what you're saying is current equals the voltage divided by the resistance. So let's just say that this was a 9 ohm resistor. Then we plug this into the formula. We have current I equals voltage. We're using 9 volts. Divided by resistance, the resistance is 9. So that means the current is 1 amp. You see? Now, if you did the same thing, but you used the 90 ohm resistor, now you've got I equals 9 divided by 90 equals a tenth of an amp. So see this resistor in this circuit or in this circle is going to dictate how much current can flow and then also your voltage is going to matter too you're, because as the voltage goes up you're going to have more current flow because you got more pressure to go through the kink as the resistance gets smaller you're going to have more current flow because you have less of a kink there less of a kink more current more gallons Okay, so anybody got any questions up to this point? Okay, there's actually a chart, and I'll be glad to email you this chart. This is your Ohm's Law chart, and if you know, and oh, by the way, power, I never did get to power. Let's go talk about power real quick. Power, which is usually measured in watts, it's always measured in watts, it, it, actually. Power equals voltage times current. So let's look at how much power is in this circuit. When it's um, one amp over here with, with a 9 ohm resistor and the 9 volt thing, your, your current would be E times I. E is... Uh, 9 volts, so you got 9 volts times I, which is 1, equals 9 watts. So in this circuit here, with the 9 ohm resistor, you've got 9 watts. Now on the other hand, if you do the next circuit we did with the uh, 90 ohm resistor, with a 90 ohm resistor, we had a tenth of an amp, so you've got 9 times a tenth equals you'd have nine tenths of a watt, you know, equals 0.9 watts, which is also called 900 milliwatts. You can always move a uh, decimal point over three and go to, to milli. So 0.9 watts is the same as, if you move that decimal point over three, it's the same as 900 milliwatts. or 0.9 watts, either way. Now, going back to our chart, uh, over here, we can figure anything out because, see, algebraically, you can manipulate those uh, equations around. Yeah, okay, you know, e, e, um, uh, let's see, where are we at? Right here. Yeah, wattage. Um, or I equals E over R. We had that one. I equals E over R. You see, you could play around with this algebraically, multiply both sides times R, and you got R I equals E. Then you could divide both sides by I, and you could say R equals E over I. Then you could do simultaneous equations with the uh, with the E and I to get different power. Um, uh, equations but rather than have to do all that you can just look at this chart and anything you want to know you can you've got the extrapolated uh, inverted equation here like say for instance if you wanted to know power and all you knew was e and r then e squared divided by r would give you your power and um Or if you knew the voltage and the uh, current, E times I equals power. 
or if you didn't know the voltage, you could square I and multiply that times R, and that would give you the power. Likewise, if you needed to know the voltage and you knew the power and the resistance, you could multiply the power times resistance, find the square root of that, and that'd give you your voltage. So see how this works. You've got all these different formulas. If you want to find voltage and all you know is the power and the current, you can use this formula. Or if you just knew the current and the resistance, you could use this formula. And it goes all the way around. Um, one that uh, uh, we could go back to this other drawing, say, for instance, uh, the one where we had nine watts. And um, uh, let's just use the resistor of nine ohms and the voltage of nine volts. Uh, voltage and resistance here. You'd take the 9 volts and square it, you get 81, then divided by the resistance, divided by 9, you'd end up with 9 watts, which is exactly what we had. You see how that works. Um, all of these equations, I'm not going to go through each one, but you, you get the idea, and I'll be glad to, uh, to email you this. In fact, I'll email everybody uh, this chart, and this is handy. You can print this out, put it by your workbench, and if you're trying to figure something out, it's real handy um, for figuring th things out. And I I'm going to show you more about how to how to use this. Uh, let's say if you've got a schematic and, you know, you look at the schematic and you see it's got a certain number of volts on one side of a resistor and a different number on the other, you can subtract the two and you know that there's that much voltage going through the resistor and, um, you know, the resistance value so you can figure out anything else you need from that. So anyway... Okay, let's talk about different ways of connecting um, resistors. There's two different ways that you can connect a resistor, two resistors. One way is in series. And the thing about a series connection, with a series connection... All current must go through both resistors. And here's your series connection. You got your resistor, and it's connected to another resistor. And let's say you hooked that up to a voltage source. Let's use a battery again because that's an easy one to draw. And there's your series circuit. We'll call this R1, call this R2 because there's two different resistors. But you see, all current must go through both. So your current goes through here. It's going to go through this resistor. Every bit of the current's going through that resistor. And then every bit of it's going through this resistor and it's coming back around through the battery and it continues again. But all current must go through both resistors. Now that's series. The other way you can connect them is in parallel. Oh, hell, it shouldn't. Okay, parallel. Parallel. In parallel, you'll have your, let's have a battery here. It's connected to a resistor. And then you've got another resistor connected to that one. Now, on this one, the current splits. With, par with parallel, the current splits. between the two resistors. So, so with this one, your current leaves here, and you got quite a bit of current le leaving here, and then when you get to here, some of it goes this way, and then some of it goes this way. Now, you can figure out what's going on in one of these circuits. I know probably some of you are thinking, what the hell would you need two resistors for? Why don't you just use one instead of use two? Um, 
you know, because one way, I mean, if R1 and R2, if these each equal 100 ohms, we put them together, you've got 200 ohms because it's twice as hard for the current to go through two 100 ohm resistors as it would be for it to go through a 100 ohm resistor. So this is 200 ohms here. If you had 100 ohm resistors over here, it would be, I don't need that extra line there. It, would, it, it ends up, the battery sees 50 ohms because since you have two paths, it now becomes twice as easy twice as easy for the current to flow because as it's coming around here it can either go this way think of two kinks that are dripping water instead of one it'd be twice as easy for it to go through over here you're going through a kink and then you're going through another kink so this way it's twice as hard and if these were 100 ohm resistors this battery would act like it was going through a, a 200 ohm resistance. Over here, this battery thinks it's, it's hooked to a 50 ohm resistance because when you put 200s in parallel, since you have two paths, it becomes twice as easy and therefore the impedance or the resistance goes down um, for, for to 50 ohms if you were using two 100 ohm um, resistors. Now there's a formula for resistors in parallel and there's a formula for resistors in series. Resistors in series, the total resistance for, re for a series circuit equals R1 plus R2 which we could see that up here. We took this 100 ohm, this 100 ohm, add them together. The total resistance is 200 ohms. But the total resistance for a parallel circuit, resistance total equals, it's going to be R1 times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. And um, so 100 times 100 is 10,000, right? 100 times 100 is 10,000. And then we're dividing that by 100 plus 100, which would be divided by 200. And that equals 50. 50 ohms. Now, in a case like this, it, you know, you really, I mean, I wouldn't even need to look at this formula to see that this is going to be 50 ohms because these are both the same value. But sometimes you'll have resistances of a different value. You know, maybe this one here might be 700 ohms and this one might be, um, you know, 1,000 ohms or something. And so it's not so easy just to, it's not as easy as just dividing it in half. So that's why you would want to use this formula. R1 times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. And uh, interesting enough, when we get to capacitors, you're going to see that the formulas for a parallel resistor is actually the same as the formula for a series um, capacitor and also uh, vice versa on the series resistance. The series resistance is going to be the same as the parallel capacitance, but that's ahead of us in... Um, We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, all right. So does anybody have any questions so far? No questions? Okay. Steve McCormick. Talk to me, Brother Stephen. Yeah, why would you use two resistors uh, two one hundreds instead of just one two hundred, uh, or why use two in the parallel instead of just use a fifty? Yeah, you see, I you know I said that a minute ago. I said some people are going to be wondering why. Right now, what I'm what I'm showing you 
is the basics of the resistance. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to use, you know, two resistors. You might just have a circuit that has a certain resistance and it's in parallel with another circuit or you, or you, you sometimes you would use these, um, for other, for other things, for like a power supply where you've, you know, you got a bunch of them in uh, series because you've got different voltages that you need to tap off of. Let's say that this is a nine volt battery here. And so right here, you would have nine volts, nine volts here, if this is a nine volt battery. But if you tapped here, you'd have 4.5 volts. Oh. See? And if you tapped over here, you'd have zero volts because this okay. minus is ground here and you're measuring from ground to different points. So to here, it'd be zero volts. Here, it'd be 4.5 volts. Here, it'd be nine volts. Now, okay. let's say, let's say you needed, okay, this breaks up, series connection breaks up the voltage. The current is the same but the voltage gets broken up. Parallel is the opposite. On parallel, the current gets broken up and the voltage is the same. Because see, um, boy, I wish I had a bigger chalkboard because I hate to erase this stuff. Uh, you know what, maybe I can move it out of the way. Let's see something here. I'll move this over some so I got a little more room to work with and I can pull it back if I need it. Um, like, okay, over here, you have the same amount of current going through R1 that's going through R2. Okay. And, um, but over here, you do not have the same amount of current. You have the same amount of voltage because if this is a nine volt, uh, um, battery here and you check from the top of this resistor to ground over here, the negative is going to be ground. You're going to have nine volts. But then if you check on this resistor to ground, you will have nine volts. So, so here your voltage is the same, but the current breaks up into two different paths. And with series, it's the opposite. The current is the same through both of them, but the voltage breaks down. Now you could even have, let's say that you had a uh, uh, circuit where um, where you wanted to put a LED, let's say. Let's say you wanted to put an LED um, in a foot pedal. You got a little foot pedal and you want to put an LED, but all you've got is a nine volt source and the LED wants to see two volts. The LED wants to draw 20 milliamps and it wants to see two volts, but all you have is a nine volt battery. So what you're going to need is a resistor. You got your battery, you got your LED, Let's see here. That's a negative, so we've got to go cathode to negative. This is this is a symbol for an LED. Then you're going to have to have a resistor. And this is a 9-volt battery. So now how are, we, how are we going to figure out what value resistor? Well, we know one thing. If this is series, and if we get 2 volts here, we're going to have 7 volts over here. Is everybody with me on that? Because you got nine volts to work with, and you want to drop two across the uh, LED, and that means you got to drop seven across here. But then also, it needs to be limited to 20 milliamps. 20 milliamps is 0.02 amps, right? So, to find um, resistance, you plug in your resistance formula. If I equals E over R and R I equals E, I multiply both sometimes E, I mean by R, 
Then you divide both sides by I and you get R equals E over I, which is what would have been on that chart. We wouldn't have had to figure all that out if we had just looked at the chart. Um, we're looking for resistance E over I. See right there? We want to know resistance. Okay, well, what's our voltage? Well, the voltage across that resistor is going to be 7, right? So the resistance is going to be E over I. That's 7 divided by 0 0.02. And when you divide 0 0.02 into 7, you got to add the zeros here. It's going to be a 350 ohm resistor. So this resistor would need to be 300 and 50 ohms and we could hook the 9 volt resistor I mean 9 volt battery to it and you got a perfectly bright LED with its 2 volts at 20 milliamps you see how that works yes mm -hmm. okay Jed's got his hand up let me call on him go ahead Jed Oh, I sent in the question, but I'll ask it anyway. Oh, okay. Is there a different formula for more than two resistors in parallel? Well, I don't know what the uh, formula would be on that. Um, I know that you could figure out two of them and then take that total resistance you figured out and then use that as R1 and then take R3 as like as if it was R2 and just do it again. I know it would work like that, but I don't know of the actual formula for that. I could figure, like I said, I could figure out what it would be. I just don't know what the formula would be. In other words, let's say you had a third one here. Uh, we're going to call this one R1 and we'll call this one R2. And let's say you had another one here and we'll call this R3. What you could do is figure out, since they're all in parallel, you could figure out what the total uh, resistance is from R1 and R2 by using this formula. And then once you did that, then you do it again, but you use the RT here and R3. So it'd be RT times R3 divided by RT plus R3. And then, you know, of course, if you had another one, you could do that again. Um, but there's probably a, a formula somewhere or how to do it. I just don't know what it is. Okay, Daniel Sullivan. Oh, you want to know if it's, uh, does it matter if the resistors in parallel, um, does it matter which order the resistors in parallel or if they're not equal values? No, it does not. It does not. And John Schaefer just put in the um, the formula for um, multiple resistors in parallel. It's um, that's good. Good here. Let me write that down. RT equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3, etc. So I didn't know that. But uh, Daniel, I've got you unmuted if you want to talk. Oh, you, do you not have a microphone? No mic, okay. All right, well, it, um, it doesn't matter which order they're in, if they're in parallel, whether they're equal values or not, it doesn't matter because you're gonna have the current split up based on the resistance and the voltage will always be the same no matter what the resistance value is. Okay, uh, Charlie Campbell. Uh, Gerald, that should be 1 over RT. Is oh, equal to one okay. Over R1. Okay, it's 1 over RT. Yeah, okay, that's right. 1 over RT, that's what he put. I, I, I transposed it wrong. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, somebody says it was in my book. Yeah. I probably researched it at the time and then forgot because that's one thing. I, I, that's a formula I hardly ever use. Let's see. <coughs> Are we always starting with a 120 volt source and working for there? No, we're not. 
we're not because there's all sorts of voltages in an amp. You know, your, your amp, uh, you've got 120 coming in, but, you know, transformers uh, in a power supply, you're going to end up making, you know, some 6.3 volt. There's going to be a 6.3 volt uh, AC circuit. There'll be a high voltage uh, DC circuit, maybe 400 volts or so, 500 volts, somewhere along in there. Uh, you have some other DC high voltages in the amp to maybe 300 volts or so to uh, power preamps. I mean, there's a lot of different voltages uh, going on in an amp. And there's multiple things happening at the same time. But the purpose of the first couple of sessions here is to get you familiarized with um, uh, to get you familiarized with all the the principles. Now, uh, Stefan wanted to know what wattage that 350 ohm resistor would be. Well, we go to the uh, um, our chart, and there you can figure it out. You need to know what. Uh, wattage it is. We know that it's a 350 ohm resistor and we know that it's dropping seven volts. So what's seven square? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, seven square. Seven square is 49 and you divide that by uh, 350 ohms. It's not going to be very much. Let's see. Uh, seven square 49 divided by 350 ohms equals it, uh, the Resistor itself is um, drawing 140 milliamps or 0.14 amps. But usually when you design something, you don't want to design it on the edge because you don't want it to overheat. You don't want it to fail. So normally your wattage, you would double it for safety. So if we double that for safety, we got 0.28. That's close enough that you could use either a quarter watt or a half watt. Um, I don't ever use anything less than a half watt. I know some people do. I just don't. I guess if you were building a little tiny pedal and you had a bunch of components in there and space was a huge issue, you could probably you could easily get away with a quarter watt on that. Cuz you know, it's 0.28 watts, it's not much difference. Okay. So, let's see what else we've got here. <coughs> We're going to talk about um, capacitors, and capacitors. Uh, what a capacitor is. Let me get rid of some of this stuff here. Get a new, a new uh, clean slate here. Okay. What a capacitor is, it is two conductors separated by a non-conductor. It will not pass DC, and the reason it won't pass DC is because there's a non-conductor in the middle of it, and the, the symbol for a capacitor is actually uh, exactly what it is. It's, it shows like two conductors, and they're not connected. And you know you got a lead on one end, lead on the other end. So you got two two conductors separated by a non-conductor. And when they make a capacitor, um, the actual amount of capacitance has to do with a couple of different factors. One is how far these plates or these two conductors are from each other. That will affect the capacitance. The other thing is the surface area of the conductors. The more surface area, the more capacitance. The closer the plates are together, the more capacitance. But then you also have capacitors are rated in usually in microfarads 
a ferret is a huge amount of capacitance. So normally they're they're uh, rated in microfarads, nanofarads, or picofarads. Um, let's say you've got a 20 microfarad uh, cap, um, which is used. You know these are usually electrolytic caps used in the power supply of an amp, or you might have a a point. 0, 0, 001 microfarad cap, but that's the same as a one nanofarad. It's spelled nano. We don't ever use nanofarad terminology over here much, but that's real big in England. They talk in nanofarads. Um, you, to go from microfarad to nanofarad, you just move the decimal point over. Uh, three places, and then you can also have um, picofarads. Picofarad is you would move it over even three more, so it would it would be hundred, a thousand, thousand picofarads. Thousand picofarads equals one nanofarad equals a thousandth of a microfarad. Um, and like I said, the way when you're making a capacitor, there's there's actually three things that determine the uh, capacitance. One of them is the distance apart that the plates are or the conductors are. The other is the surface area, and the third thing is what the non-conductor is. Now, what the non-conductor is called is this a fancy word? It's called a dielectric. That's the hundred dollar word for non-conductor okay and you can use a, any almost anything that's a non-conductor as a dielectric you can use paper you can use glass you can use air you can use wood you can use basically anything that doesn't conduct uh, as a dielectric now when i was doing my seminars um a while back in fact i spent about 14 years doing seminars all over the country and one of the things that we would do is we would make a capacitor with two sheets of aluminum foil and a couple of pieces of typing paper. What I would do is I would take, let's see, I would take a couple of pieces of foil and I would hook these to a capacitance meter. Uh oh, that's the wrong deal here. I got to go to this. I'd hook it to a capacitance meter, and we'd put a piece of paper in between this and put that over on the top of it and you'd get a reading. Now I want to tell you before we even did that we took the meter by itself with no leads plugged in and we zeroed the meter out to zero capacitance where there was zero capacitance okay but then after that we plugged just the the meter leads in but we didn't hook them up to anything and when you just plug the meter leads in and didn't even hook them up to anything you would get about 10 picofarads of capacitance on the meter and it was just the capacitance between this wire and this wire even though they were both going opposite directions and the reason I tell you that is so you'll know that there's all kind of little stray capacitances going on inside of an amp. You know, if you've got a wire that's even a few inches away, there'll be, you know, some capacitance between one wire and another wire. And that's where you get, you end up with phantom circuits and that sort of stuff. But, okay, so anyway, we hook these together and we actually have the paper underneath you know in between the two I've, I've got it drawn different here but we got the paper in between the two and then you know maybe it's 
100 picofarads. And then we take the paper and put another piece of paper on top and we start rolling it up. And when you roll it up, it gets them closer together because see, you're getting them uh, tighter together. And remember I told you when this chain, when this gets smaller, it gets closer together, you get your capacitance goes up. We'd roll it up and you know, it'd go up to maybe 400 peak farads. Then I would take it and after it was rolled up and fold it in half and it'd be maybe uh, 1200 peak farads. And then I'd fold it again and get, get it tighter and tighter and tighter. I could get by taking two pieces of aluminum foil and a couple of pieces of typing paper, I could get to a 0 0.02 microfarad out of just that. And it would be about the size of a standard coupling cap that you would see in an amp. Now the formulas for capacitors in series and capacitors in parallel are exactly the same as the resistors formulas, but opposite. That is to say, for your capacitors uh, in series, let me get another clean slate here. On your capacitors in series, let's say you had two capacitors hooked up. See, this is not going to have as, as much uh, capacitance because now you've got more more non-conductors. See, see, this has got a certain amount of non-conductor. This is even more. So it ends up being your total capacitance. This is going to be C1 and C2. Is going to be C1 times C2 over C1. I'm sorry, plus C2. It's a series. But if you notice, it's the same as the parallel formula for resistors. <coughs> okay. Now, if we're going to do parallel, I want you to notice when you're doing parallel, it's like you're doubling the surface area. See, you got this surface area here, this surface area. You got a lot more surface area. So you're doubling your surface area, and it's going to end up being additive just like series resistors. Your total capacitance equals C1 plus C2. And see, this is easy to remember because you can look at this drawing, and you can see you got more surface area. Just think of it as this. Think of it as being a great big capacitor, you know? And then this one over here, you've got more um, space between the conductors. Now, let's talk about voltage. When you hook a capacitor in series, the voltage is additive. And for right now, we're going to assume that you got the same two, two capacitors, the same value. Let's say this is a 500 volt capacitor. Let's say it's uh, 20 microfarads at 500. And this one's 20 microfarads at 500. Well, when you put them in series, the capacitance formula here, it's going to end up, they're going to end up being 10, 10 microfarads. So it'll be 10 microfarads, but it'll be at a thousand volts because the voltage is additive, but the capacitance is not. And if you plug this formula in, you know, 20 times 20 is 400 and then divided by 20 plus 20 is 40, you get 10. And that's what it is. It's 10, 10 microfarads at 1,000 volts. On your parallel, which is over here,
connection, the voltage is always the smaller of the two. If they're the same, it's you know it's just the, whatever one of them is, but it's always the smaller of the two. But the capacitance itself is additive. So if you had uh, the same 20 microfarad at 500 volt caps here, then the total would be 40 microfarads at 500 volt. The 500 volts is just a rating. You wouldn't necessarily have 500 volts across these. It's just how much the capacitor can take before it arcs. You know, because this is a, a non-conductor here, and you don't want it to arc. If you get enough voltage on it, it'll arc like lightning, and you don't want that. So these are 500 volts. They're right. They can handle 500 volts without arcing. But you put two of them together in parallel, and they're still only going to handle 500 volts because they're still the same distance apart. It's the distance apart that controls what the voltage is in a capacitor. But it's also going to, um, you know, if you get them too far apart, your capacitance starts going down dramatically. So um, you would have to increase the surface area to make up for that if you were going for a higher voltage cap. And that's why high voltage caps are usually bigger. High voltage caps are a lot bigger than a low voltage. Okay. Okay, so that's what we've got for tonight, and uh, this I realize that this is uh, it's all real basic stuff. We're going to be getting next week. We're going to be getting into uh, diodes, rectifiers, power supply, and it's real important that you understand the power supply because your power supply is the the heart of the amp. The guitar signal doesn't go through the amp. The guitar signal goes through one resistor and one resistor only. Everything else that goes through the amp is just modulated power supply. So we've got to we've got to really teach you about the power supplies, and we're going to do that next week. And we're also going to talk about the diodes and uh, the different types of rectifiers and power supplies and that sort of thing, chokes and um, so anyway, I'm going to pause for a minute before we before we stop. Does anybody have any uh, questions? Frank Mallets, Frank Mallets. You can talk, uh, Frank. I got you unmuted. Okay. Let's see, John. Uh, where's John? John Wright, talk hey, to uh, me. I, pro I probably can't make it next week. Is there a way to watch after the fact somehow? Yeah, I am recording these, and um, I, I don't know if we can put them on YouTube because they're, is they're so big files. I don't, I don't know. I've never done that before, but I'm going to try to. I'll see what I can do. If not, maybe we can get it on Vimeo or something. But, no, I'm going to I'm gonna put them on uh, – I'm recording them, and we're going we're gonna to publish them someplace for you guys to uh, – do a review. Okay. Will you email us about it or something? Yeah, of course I will. Of course I will. Everybody gets a link. Okay. All right. Good man. Cool. Cool, man. All right. Anybody else got any other questions? Okay. I'm stopping the recording.